Hi everybody and welcome to Bernina version 9 software introduction. If you have questions for our presenter Debbie Lashbrook, please enter them in the questions box during the presentation and we'll have a short Q&A session at the very end. Today we have one handout available for you. It is in the handout in your control panel. Please download that during the presentation. And if you aren't able to download it during the presentation, it will be available for you on Bernina.com in a few days. If you're viewing on an Apple product, your screen might look a little different. At the very bottom, you're going to see a questions mark icon. That's where you're going to type in your questions for Debbie. Also, the three dots are where the handouts are located, and you can download the PDF. If during any part of our presentation, you have audio or visual difficulties, please exit the webinar and re-enter. That solves most issues. And if you happen to miss any part of our presentation, it is being recorded and it will be available on Bernina.com and YouTube in a few days. So now I'd like to turn it over to Debbie Lashbrook, who is going to tell us all about the new components of software version nine. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Emily. And thank you, Emily, and welcome everyone. And as soon as we get, um, the screen share going, we'll get started. Okay, the webinar is about what all is new with version nine. I'm sure that many of you are very excited about it. Some of you probably have already put money down uh, on an update. Some of you may not have software at all and you just wanna know what it's all about. Uh, others of you may be trying to decide if you wanna update. Some of you may have downloaded the trial version. We do have a 30-day trial version that you can download from the website, and um, that is available to you. And some of you may already have had the ver trial version, and now you're just patiently waiting for version 9 to show up. Um, it should be at the dealer store sometime next month, so that's uh, good news. I'm going to start kind of going through some screens from version nine, and then we'll get into the specifics about what is new. But one of the things is a new, a new home screen, and the software will open up to a home screen uh, that you're looking at now on the screen. So let me move some things out of the way here. Um, from this home screen, you're able to go to Embroidery Canvas or Embroidery Library. The, there's tutorials, there's a My Profile tab, there's a Help button, and then there's access to all sorts of webinars, uh, OESD projects, and the blog. That's all over on the right-hand side. You can also go directly to a new design, or you can open a design, or you can open a recent design. And on the home screen, after working in the software world for a while, if you act if you move a design file from where you originally saved it, it's going to show up with an X through the file. So that's what that red X means. So all these things are available on your home screen. Now you do have the choice, if you don't like the software opening to the home screen, you can go into your options and change that to either go directly to Embroidery Canvas, which is what our software currently does, or you can elect to go to directly to the embroidery library. So you have choices. So on the home screen, like I mentioned, there are video tutorials, there's my profile, all sorts of information that you see on this slide. One thing that I want to mention on the tutorials, these are software tutorials. They're short tutorials that take you through how to use the software. In order to access them, you have to first click on Feature Tutorials, and this would be in the Tutorials tab. You click on Feature Tutorials, and that will take you to the screen with all the tutorials. There are, there are 268 videos, and these are linked to YouTube, but they're built into the software, and then th that way you don't have to search for them on YouTube, and they're listed kind of in the order that you should review them uh, for learning about the software. The online help, there are um, tabs that you can use in the online help. There's a table of contents tab, uh, a tab. You can also do the A to Z and it will give you an alphabetical listing of what's in the software. And there's also a search tab. You can also download reference manuals, uh, from this or view ref reference manuals as well. 
you do have to be online to use this help manual. When the software screen opens, there are a couple of things I want to point out. It's very much similar to version 7 and version 8 in that there are toolboxes over on the left-hand side that have other icons in them. But a couple things I want to point out. The art grade is now back on the screen in the lower right corner. In version 8, it wasn't displayed on the status bar. It is back showing the grade. And if you'll remember, the grade of a design is important because it pretty much tells you what you can do with that design. Grade A Pure Art is gives you the most editing capabilities. Grade, um, there's, there are also grade B, C, and D designs. This isn't like a grade that you get in school. Um, it doesn't mean the design is good or bad. It just tells you what you can do with that design. With grade C and D designs, you have a little bit less editing capabilities and the you can't increase the design size as much as you can with the pure art. The only way to get pure art designs would be to buy from a designer who saves in art and works in our software. Or OESD designs, or some, or if you create your own designs in the software, they're of course pure art. But a designer can use um, our software and not save as an art file, and that will not be a pure art design either. So OESD creates pure art, or if you create your own designs, you know that they're pure art. One other thing about the screen up in the upper right, where you see the um, view toolbar. Anything that's blue, that means that icon is activated. So it's very easy to tell if there's a hoop on the screen, if you've got a grid activated, if you've got a picture activated. So icons used to turn gold and now they turn blue. Now, if you're looking at software for the very first time, you have two product models to choose from. We have a Designer Plus level, which has full digitizing capabilities. And then we have a Creator level software that lets you have a lot of different editing tools and some basic digitizing, not as many uh, digitizing capabilities as Designer Plus. Also, the creator level does not come with the Wi-Fi device, which we'll talk about in a, in a bit. This kind of shows you the difference between Designer Plus and Creator. Basically, the Designer Plus package has more fonts, uh, more fills, more art, more designs, and more tools. Um, there are some things that you're able to do in Designer Plus that you cannot do in Creator. And if you're interested in learning the differences, I would suggest that you stop by your dealership and find out more detail about that. This next slide shows you the difference between version 8 and version 9. And I will go through each of these in a, in a minute, but you do have this as well on your handout. So if you do have version 8, there are quite a quite a few new things that are pretty exciting in the software. One of the big things is the Wi-Fi device. So this allows you to send designs from Embroidery Canvas or Embroidery Library in version 9 via a Wi-Fi device that's pictured here on the slide. The Wi-Fi device plugs into your machine. You have to first set it up on your computer and connect it to your Wi-Fi. And then you take it to your machine where it is stays plugged in. The Wi-Fi device is included with Designer Plus um, version 9. It is not included with Creator version 9, but Creator will work with it if you want to purchase the device. It is also included in update packages to version 9. So if you have an older version of software and you purchase an update package, you do get the Wi-Fi device. It is important if you have a current machine to have the latest machine firmware installed and you can check with your dealer about what is the latest version for the particular machine that you have. There is a quick start guide that helps you set up the Wi-Fi device and it kind of outlines the process. Basically, you start out with the device connected to your computer and you connect that device to the Wi-Fi, make sure it's activated and uh, then you'll unplug it and take it over to your machine and keep it plugged in then. 
there are specific steps involved. You do want to always launch with the Wi-Fi connector, and this is going to be an icon on your desktop. So that's where you will begin to set up the device to connect to your um, Wi-Fi. There are also two tutorials in the software that tell you how to set up the device. And then the other tutorial talks about how to send designs to the device. So you can still send them through the other methods. A USB stick will still work, that's fine. Or you can now will have the Wi-Fi. It's very easy to tell when the Wi-Fi device is working because the lights turn on and you know that it is the connection has been established. If you are updating your machine at a later date, you want to make sure to unplug the device when you do an update. And that would be for the machines that have two USB ports. You always want to unplug the um, device from an 880, for example, before you update your machine. It is best to only have one device allotted per machine. So if you have two machines in your studio and you want to have both of them have the capability of getting designs wirelessly, it's better to purchase an extra device. Or you can designate one machine to use the Wi-Fi and then just use a USB stick for the other machine. As I mentioned earlier, it's best to keep the device plugged into the machine after getting it all set up. And that way it takes less time to um, send the designs when you boot up your machine. If you're going to use one device for multiple machines, it is possible, but you will need to do a factory reset in order to switch it from machine to machine. And here you see, how you do a, a factory reset. There's a pinhole in the side and you just um, stick a hairpin in there and, and that will um, reactivate and reset the, the device. And if you have more than one computers in your households and you have the software on more than one computer, it's best to have only one computer of the network connected to the device. Don't try to set up multiple computers with the uh, with the one device. There are a lot of machines that will work with the Wi-Fi current machines as well as older machines. One uh, thing that I want to point out, the Artista 200 must be updated in order to work with the Wi-Fi device. And if you had your Artista 200 updated to be a 730, then it will work um, with the Wi-Fi device. The Artista 200 has to recognize a USB stick. So um, as long as you have that, and if you if you got the stitch regulator to work with your Artista 200, that is also an indication that it, it has been updated. The E16, remember, does not have a USB port. It uses an ethernet cable to connect to the machine. And of course, the Auroras do not have a USB port. They connect directly to the computer. So the Wi-Fi device is not used with Auroras. The Burnett Chicago 7 down at the bottom of the screen is also a, a machine that will not work with the Wi-Fi, but a lot of machines will work with the Wi-Fi, including other brands of machines, Bernina International did a lot of testing for other brands, and they found a lot of um, capability uh, and compatibility with the Wi-Fi device. Now, the Wi-Fi device will store designs, but it is not designated or designed for storage of your designs. You always want to save your designs on your computer and use the Wi-Fi device to be a transfer of designs. The Wi-Fi device has 80 megabytes, so it does not have a lot of storage on it. So you'll want to use it mainly just to transfer the designs. When you're done stitching them out, remove them from the device, and that keeps your storage uh, from getting too high. Now, you do need to be connected to the internet in some cases for your software. So I wanted to go over when it is required. First of all, to install the software, you will need a connection to the internet. And then you want to make sure that you're on the internet once every 30 days to verify your account. Now, otherwise, what that means is you're going to have to re-verify, which is it amounts to 
um, when you try to open the software, it will tell you, you'll get a message that you need to enter your email, enter your password, you get a verification code, and then you re-verify your account to get it open. So every 30 days, um, if, as long as you're on the internet and in the software, you'll be fine. You also need to be on the internet to view the tutorials because the tutorials are housed on YouTube. They're not built into the software. There's a link to YouTube. And you also need to be online when you use the help menu. So in the help menu, when you go to uh, online help, you have to be online. You do not have to be online to use the reference manual. The reference manual is on screen, not online. And then if you want to change your license, say you get a new computer and you want to take the software off one computer and put it on a new computer, you do have to be online to change the license. Just as a reminder, when you are going through the process of installing the software, please remember to check Keep Me Signed In, and that will keep you um, your account activated, and you won't have to enter your email and password every time you open. So that is an important step. Just check Keep Me Signed In. One of the nice things about version 9 is changing a license is a lot easier. Some of you had to do this with version 8, but you, the software can be installed and activated on three computers. And since version 9 is a web-based sign-in and sign-out, the activation is not stored on your computer as version 8 was. So all you have to do is you have two ways of uh, releasing a license. One is through the file menu and you just come down and sign out and release license. The other way is through my profile in the help menu. So it, the help screen. The help screen, you would go to it, click on my profile and then click on active sessions. And then you can end the session on the computer that you, you um, would like to release it from. So you can have it installed and working on three computers when you get a fourth computer, if you get a fourth computer, you would want to deactivate one of the sessions. If you want to change your password, it is easier to change your password or your email address. You just go, <coughs> pardon me, you just go into my profile again and change the email or change your password. When you do this, you're sent a verification code just to make sure it's you and not somebody else. And then you enter that verification code and you can then have your software reassigned to your new email address. Another really great thing about version 9 is that if you lose a toolbar or you misplace it, say you click and drag and you put it somewhere and you can't find it, there is now a tool layout reset in the revert um, a part of the software. So you go to your programs, you find Bernina Designer Plus 9 or Creator 9, and come down and click on revert. This dialog box, box pops up and you check toolbar layout and click OK. You'll do this with the software closed, of course, and then when you reopen the software, it will be set to go. If you had a 4K computer and had Quilter, you know that the icons were extremely tiny on this. So with um, version 9, it's now 4K compatible. You'll be able to see those icons and uh, recognize what they are, and you won't need a magnifying glass to see those. There are new toolboxes in version 9. You're just looking at version 9 on the left, version 8 on the right. And there is a lettering and monogramming toolbox, as well as an applique toolbox. These tools have been taken out of the digitized toolbox, and they have their own separate toolbox. It's really nice because if you really like to create applique, all those applique tools are housed in that same toolbox. And likewise, the lettering and monogram, if you do a lot of that, you're able to quickly go to that and start your lettering or monogramming. 
we have a new function. It's with an old tool, but it's a new function. And these are when you increase or decrease the size of the design. In version 8 and earlier versions, these icons would change a design by 20%. That amount has been changed to 10%, which is more in line with what the suggested size changes are for your foreign format. In other words, any non-art file. That's a quick way to resize that design. Here on the screen, um, the red shows you the, or the original size, and then the green shows the design decreased by 10% and the blue shows it decreased by 20. That gives you a visual of what that uh, the difference is going to be. There's also a change in the color palette. There's still the same number of default colors, but with the current color, it's now going to be surrounded by a dark black border. So it's very easy to look down at your color palette and to see what the current color is. There are some changes in lettering object properties and the select character used to be down in the lower left corner. It's been moved up here right under the text box. There's also a new type and that's keyboard design collection. I'll go into detail about that in a minute, but this allows you to assign keyboard strokes to lettering designs. Another great convenient change, I think, is the size range that you see next to alphabets. And many of you who've used the software may know this, but some of you may not. When the lettering is digitized, it's digitized for a certain size range in mind. And if you go lower than that, you can have problems with underlay peeking out underneath the stitches. Or if you go over that size range, you may have too uh, wide of satin stitches in the lettering. So there's always a suggested size range. Previously, you would have to go to the reference manual, look up in the appendices to get the, that information about the suggested size range. And now it's right there on screen when you are choosing your lettering. Now it will only be available for the um, alphabet fonts, not for true type fonts. In the options, there, have, uh, there are a couple of changes. And again, you're work, looking at B9 on the left, B8 on the right. As far as start in, this is what I was telling you in the beginning where the software opens to a home screen. That's the default. But if you prefer to open an embroidery canvas or embroidery library, you can set that and then click OK. And then the next time you open software, it will start in whatever you picked. You can always go back and change that if you want. And if you do a revert of the software, it's going to take you back to the home screen. You can also choose the number of recently used fonts. So the highest number, I believe, is eight. Um, but you can click on that drop down arrow, change the amount, and then that will show you the view of your most recently used fonts. You can also change the font size. So if you want a bigger view of the font, you can choose extra large. There are some new tools in the edit toolbox, and this is some of the some of the best tools. Some of the best tools are here. We have branching, apply, closest join, and weld, and I'll be talking about each of those in a little bit. Next, we're going to look at all the features, and I've kind of put them in A to Z order, so in, in no particular order about other than in alphabetical order. So the first applique improvements. We have the new toolbox, as I mentioned earlier. Some of the icons are new, some of them are uh, new names, and others are kind of placed in a new toolbox. So the digitized applique is what formerly was called applique, and this works just like the applique tool. You click on it and then you can digitize the applique with left and right clicks to create your applique design. Now applique with holes we've had but it was an option in the applique tab of the options dialog box. And 
applique with holes would be what you would use if you were going to um, digitize a letter like the letter B or P where there, were, there was a hole, or if you were doing a flower with an opening in the center, you would use that. And like I said, it, it was in previous versions, but it now has a specific icon that you can use. Convert to applique, we've also had, never, not many people knew about it though, because it was kind of hidden. We could, we could use the applique tool to convert an, a stitch design into an applique. But now we have an icon. So you can take a, a stitch design that's either fill stitches or an outline stitch and click on convert to applique and the software automatically adds a placement line, a tap down line, and a cover. Combined applique is not necessarily a new feature. It is a new icon though. And what we would do in previous versions after we created the applique is we'd have to break apart the applique and then we would move or resequence all the placement lines so they stitch together, all the tack down lines so they would stitch together, and then we'd have the cover stitch. With the combine applique feature, it is suggested that you always save the applique as an applique first, because when you click on combine applique, the software automatically breaks it apart, breaks all the applique apart, and resequences the applique. So it's it does the same thing that we used to be able to do, but with one click instead of a couple clicks or more than a couple by the time you resequence everything. I also love the fact that remove overlaps and break apart are in the applique toolbox. You don't you no longer have to go to the edit toolbox to use these. Now you will find them in the edit toolbox as well but they're right there convenient for you. And remove applique overlaps is another one of those. So all three of those icons you'll find in the applique toolbox. Then export cutting files is new. And this lets you export both SVG files as well as cutwork files directly from the embroidery canvas. The applique dialog box has changed and all the, the steps are kind of more in order of how an applique is formed. You have a placement line first, then you have a cutting line. Cutting line is deactivated by default, but if you want a cutting line, you can place a check mark by cutting line and then you can cut around the fabric after it's tacked down with the cutting line. The tack down stitch, you, we have some different types, some new types of tack downs and cover stitch, you'll also find some new types. Previously, you could only use satin or a blanket stitch cover if you used the applique tool. Now you can do a single stitch or you can do a zigzag stitch with our applique. There's more control over offsets as well. And then, of course, you can add your fabric. The tack down and cover stitch offset are created relative to the stitch width of the cover offset, but you can uncheck that and then you can change um, the placement line as well as the offset. And this is what the export cutting file looks like. When you click on that, you get a dialog box and you can export SVG files in the case of uh, if you have a cutting machine, or you can export EXP designs to use with the Cutwork tool. Now they automatically go to a file folder that's set up for you called My Cutting Files. You can always browse to another location if you prefer. Apply closest join is another new feature. This is in the edit toolbox and apply closest join while digitizing is activated by default and this has been in the options toolbox for uh, not options toolbox, the uh, options dialog box for a number of years. But what this means is if I digitize this first design and then digitize a second the software automatically places the stops and starts 
so that they create the closest join. The software still does that, but the difference in V8 and V9 is that if after digitizing this, I say I want to move this to the left of that first design. After I move it, this is what happens. The start point of that second object stays where it was. And then the end point is uh, the, this first design is where it was. So we now have a longer jump stitch. And in some cases, if your machine does not trim, you would have to stop and trim that or else you would be stitching over that jump stitch. That is what happens with version eight if you don't go in and change your starts and stops. So even though we have apply closest join in the option, we now have an apply closest join tool in the edit toolbox. So if I make that same change in version nine, I select these objects and I go to the edit toolbox and click on apply closest join. And the software automatically changes the starts and stops of those two designs so that the closest join is now effective in the new position. So it comes in handy when you move things around or maybe you change the order of a design uh, as you're digitizing. It's mainly a digitizing feature, but it is a nice feature to, uh, to make a more efficient design because the shorter our jump stitches are, the less time a design will take to stitch out. Onto automatic digitizing. There have been improved algorithm, algorithms in our auto digitizing program, so we have some better results. Also, the newer JPEG formats um, had a little bit of a problem with version eight. They now work in version nine. You may get an import failed message with a uh, newer JPEG, or the, sometimes the JPEG turns colors. So you will not see that in version nine. Automatic pull compensation has been changed for automatically digitized items, and you don't have to remember to go in and change this. If you recall, pull compensation is the pulling in of a design as it stitches on fabric. So um, with auto digitized items, it is suggested that you increase this to 0.4. Now the software is automatically going to do that, and the software makes the decision based on whether um, what type of object it is, what kind of, kind of stitch it is, the size of the object, and then the fabric selected. So you don't have to know um, or remember how to change that. There's also some great new artwork. Um, Gabby Seberg has some great designs that are gonna be fun to applique or automatically digitize or, or use as a backdrop for digitizing. We've got some new color stitch artwork as well, and some new basic shape artwork. And these basic shapes are gonna be great for applique or for creating monogram borders. We can now batch upload fabric files, and before files would have to be loaded one at a time. So if you were importing a lot of fa different fabrics to put on a quilt or to use an applique, it would take a lot longer. Now, I will give you a tip here. You want to keep your fabric name short in order to batch upload. These fabrics that you see here, I would want to shorten these fabric names. The shorter the fabric name, the more fabrics you can batch upload. So make them meaningful to you. You can always rename them after you load them into the software. Branching is one of the features I'm really excited about because it again, it, for those of you who like to digitize, it's really, really going to help you. And even if you automatically digitize, you're gonna be able to use this. But what branching is, it lets you digitize objects without regard to thinking through the pathing of a design. So you can see all the jump stitch in, in you can see all the jump stitches in this design. And in this case, I just created these, all these haphazardly without thinking about how to set the travel stitches to eliminate jump stitches. Once those objects are digitized 
and everything has to touch and it also has to be the same color or it will end up being the same color after you apply branching. But you just select everything after you get all your objects created and you click on branching and two clicks on the design and all the jump stitches are eliminated except for the jump stitch. In this case, it goes from the center of the hoop to the first stitch of the design and then from the center of the hoop to, um, or from the last stitch of the design to the center of the hoop. So branching is very similar to Blackwork Run and we've had Blackwork Run since version three. Branching works with fills and some of the outlines. Blackwork Run will work with some outlines. With branching, you enter both a start and an end point. With Blackwork Run, you enter one reference point because the start point same as the endpoint. Some lines may be stitched more than once with branching and with Blackwork Run, the lines are stitched twice. On to the contour fill, and we have some expanded uses of the contour fill. Previously, only the block digitizing tool or the ellipse tool could be used with a contour fill. Now we can use the rectangle tool, we can use the freehand um, closed object tool, or we can use the closed object tool. So you have lots of different possibilities for creating some nice, abstract, interesting designs now with the contour fill. Remember the contour fill stitches parallel rows that conform, uh, conform to the shape of the object. Then we also have some new designs. There's a basic shape folder. There are 930 designs in Designer Plus and 384 in Creator. The trial version has 45 designs. <clears throat> These 70 basic shapes are great, again, for creating applique designs or fill designs or outline designs or monogram borders. Then we have inspiration folder and the inspiration folder designs have some designs that have been featured in the Bernina International Inspiration Magazine. And then there is project folder and the project folder includes block um, like um, in the hoop designs and quilting um, in the hoop as well as quilt labels. So these are ready for you to import into the software and apply them to your projects. We also have some fun new things in CorelDRAW SE, and SE stands for Special Edition. And Special Edition has more than Corel's basic essentials package, but it doesn't quite have all that their full package does, but it has a lot of fun new features. So um, Connect Content is a, a new feature, and I've got slides for each of these, so I'm just gonna go ahead and go through the slides. The content exchange was something that we used to have. And in 2018, the content was discontinued by Corel. And in November, 2020, all those artwork designs that we used to be able to access went away. So um, the free content is available as part of the uh, Connect content. And you just go to the Docker and you can download and install fonts. There are templates you can install. There are lots of artwork design uh, artwork that you can also install. The pointilizer is a new feature and this takes a, a repetitive shape and puts it in. You decide how many shapes you want and it adds it to your area in multiple sizes and it's a printing effect. This is something that you would print to use as a background for some um, stitching. A cocktail is a picture created of pictures. So you, if you look at closely at these squares, these are all different floral pictures, but it's one big picture of a floral arrangement as well. This is going to be a fun kind of uh, effect, again, for printing, you can't transfer this into designs, uh, embroidery designs. Then another new 
feature is fit objects to path. And here you create the object, you draw a path, and then you fit that object to the path. Kind of like fitting text to path, only in this case, you've created an object. This is version eight. This shows version nine. And in Object Manager, which is a lot like color film, you have in version eight, you would have tiny um, squirrels of uh, swirls of color that, and this has been enlarged. So in version eight, when you're looking in Corel, it's really, really tiny and sometimes hard to see. Is it an outline? Is it a fill? What color is it? What object is it? In version nine Corel, we're going to have the objects themselves showing an object man manager. So it's really easy to tell what object is uh, what shape. There have also been some cut work improvements. Cut is now the default border type. It used to be that stump work or piece was the uh, default type of border, now cut is. And most people do cut work, not too many people will do stump work. So the cut work makes sense that it's the default border type. Also new is the running before stitches are added automatically to the design. You no longer have to go in and add an outline when you work with the cut work uh, border. The cut work docker has been simplified as well. We used to have five different kinds of holes as well as a cut and a piece. Now you choose if you choose cut, if you want to create a cut line like you would in applique. You choose piece if you want to create a stump work. And then you choose whole if you want to create an embroidery design that's been cut out and then embroider around that cutout. So it's creating a whole. You don't need to know what type of hole. You only need to know, do you want to do a covered edge or do you want to do a raw edge? There's also a convert to cutwork border icon in the cutwork stump work toolbox. And this will convert a closed shape or an outline to cutwork with a border. So if you have an object like this and you click on it, it's going to create the cut line around that shape. I mentioned the SVG file is a uh, easy to output. You, you just choose SVG or EXP. EXP is the choice that you make if you're going to do a cut work and um, SVG if you're going to export the file to a cutting machine. Embroidery library has some changes and here you can work with keyboard lettering or you can also send your designs to the Bernina Wi-Fi device. This shows version eight, this is version nine. You can also view pictures now, like you could in the old versions of software when we had portfolio. In version eight, we couldn't view the pictures. There are six new fonts. And then the big news is keyboard lettering. Here is where you can map lettering designs to a keyboard character. Those, the characters can be either alphabets or objects, and then you save that as a collection. You can edit the uh, lettering collections if you want, and this can be done either from Embroidery Library or Embroidery Canvas. There are five keyboard uh, letter collections that come with the software, but you can certainly use other embroidery designs. If you're working with a grade A, generally the height range that you can use is the plus or minus 20%. For other grades, you want to keep that to 10%. So that's when that quick icon will really come in handy for you. These are the five collections that come with the software. You have uniquely plaid, charming numbers, damask, quilted alphabet, and the etched alphabet. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about BX fonts and ESA fonts. These are collections. These are lettering collections. The BX fonts are specific to Embrilliance. The ESA fonts are specific to Hatch or Wilcom. When we map a keyboard collection, it becomes a KDC collection 
and that is going to be specific to our software. So when you're looking for lettering collections, you want to look for machine file formats in order to map those into your KDC collections. The um, files like a PES, a PES, a uh, let's say PES, PCS, uh, XXX, HUS, those kinds of machine file formats is what you're going to look for. In addition, OESD has some beautiful lettering collections that could be mapped. Changes in monogramming, there is a recommended height range now in the monogramming docker for, again, embroidered alphabets. And then we can also create custom templates in the monogramming docker and save these templates. For example, if we create a border and we'd like to be able to access that and have a, a favorite ornament that we're going to add, or we have certain initials that we use a lot, you can create a custom template that shows up in your monogramming docker and you just click and it's ready to send to the machine. Patterns, there are new patterns. There are 613 total in Designer Plus and 382 in Creator. And um, these are some of the new collections that you'll find. Another nice touch, the uh, symbol when you're moving starts and stops has been changed to a hand symbol. And when you're actually on a control point and trying to change that control point or move that control point, you'll get a four pointed cross. So there's less of a chance that you grab a, a control point when you're trying to move a start and stop. Again, a nice convenience. Another nice convenience it come, is for rotating hoops. For a single design, um, you, you no longer have to go to multi-hooping toolbox. You can rotate the hoop right there in the um, digitizing screen. So you've got a opportunity to rotate at 15 degrees to left or right where you can input a certain value. For multi-hooping designs, you're going to want to do that in the multi-hooping toolbox. But for single designs, you can do that in the, the uh, digitizing toolbox. Thread charts have been updated. The names uh, have been updated to be consistent with other softwares. The Isochord shade is back, and this is a, a group that's sorted by colors with the Isochord thread rather than numerically. Sometimes you, you know you want to use a red, you don't know what color number to use, so if you go to that sorted um, or the shades threads, it's much easier to pick out a color of red. RGB colors for DMC cotton have been improved, RGB colors for Madeira have been improved, and discontinued threads are also included because you may still have those threads in your stash. And if they are in the collection, they will be labeled as discontinued so that you know that you can't purchase it. But if it's in your stash, you can certainly apply it to your design so you can see what that color would look like. Another tool I've had lots of fun with is the weld tool. And this merges overlapping objects into a single um, object. So this design at, on the lower part of the screen was created with the design above. So you have a diamond shape and you have several circles on top, you weld and then you can turn it into a satin stitch scallop. You can apply to different fill types and the properties of the top object is generally going to be applied to all objects underneath. You want to check out the manual for this because there are some things that might not happen as you might expect. For example, a color blend that's on top of a basic fill stitch is not going to transfer into a color blend, it's going to transfer into a gradient fill. Likewise, two color blended objects will yield a gradient fill. If you have a 3D globe object on top of a regular fill, the bottom fill will adapt to the whatever kind of fill is in the globe, but it will not transfer that globe effect. And then if you have a satin outline with step fills on top, 
the, the outline stays an outline, but it turns into a step fill. On to system requirements, um, Windows 10, there, and there have been some changes here. So Windows 10, 64-bit with the latest updates is required for version 9. The, there are differences too in minimum and recommended. You can download these requirements from the website and if you're getting a new computer, make sure you take those system requirements with you as you're shopping for a new computer. Remember, minimum means that, minimum. If you get the recommended, you'll be better off because your computer will run more efficiently with version 9. Mac computers with an M1 chip uh, boot camp is not going to run on these. You have to have parallels. We haven't tested parallels uh, with this new uh, Mac computer, so I uh, can't give a recommendation yet about that. Intel based Mac computers using boot camp with Windows 10 will be fine. And um, that's just if for those of you who are interested with uh, and have Mac computers, run your, uh, if you're thinking about buying a new one, run your system requirements through our software support and they will be able to tell you. As far as installation steps, your installation files are going to be coming on a USB stick with version 9. There are two end user agreements that you have to click through, and then you complete the installation steps. Corel Draw SE will install first and then version 9. You'll ask to be re um, restart your computer, and you get a message to uh, that um, the software has been successfully installed. You'll click on OK to uh, link to Corel in the case of Designer Plus software. You want to open Corel Draw SE and register if you've not ever registered with Corel and close that application. Then when you open V9, you'll create an account. You'll need email and password in order to create that account. You receive a verification code through that email account and then you enter the product key. Now, when you go through this process, version 9 replaces V8 on your computer. If you have V8 on three computers and you download V9 only on one of those computers, you will still not be able to use V8 because it deactivates your version 8 unless you buy a full package of version 9. The, um, it, but it would have to be a full package in order to work both version 8 and version 9. Now if you have version 6 or version 7 and update to version 9, you use your dongle in order to update. You don't have a product key. You will not have to install your software on uh, your old software on a new computer. You will just install version 9 on that brand new computer. And in the case of version six or seven, you plug the dongle in when you're directed to, and that will deactivate your dongle. So you will have the complete version nine on that one computer. If you put it on a second computer, you will not need the dongle to place it on a second computer. You just need your email address and your password. Remember, um, in, you will have a question about merging an old version of software with the new. It's, you don't have to remove earlier versions of the software. If you want your old, uh, say, uh, patterns that you created in version in previous versions or the custom monogram borders that you may have created or quilting fabrics that you've downloaded, you'll want to be sure and merge your old software with the new and that way you'll have access to all those things with your version 9. If you don't merge then you'll have to recreate those or um, download all your fabrics again. Again just a reminder keep me signed in needs to be ticked Otherwise, the software is going to require an internet connection to get started because you're going to have to receive a verification code again. 
I want to reiterate, once V9 is installed, version 6, version 7, and version 8 will be deactivated. The only way to have both version, an older version and version 9 on your computer is to buy a full package. When you update an older version, you lose the older version. If you install on, the on a second computer, again, you don't have to use that deactivated dongle to complete the installation. You'll just put your email address in and your password and that will complete the activation. You can have the version nine on three computers. If you want to install it on a fourth computer, you can install it on a fourth computer, but you would have to release the license from one of those computers to uh, be able to use it on your new computer. Windows 11 has been tested with version 8.2 and version 9, and Bernina International tells me they don't expect any issues specifically for version 8.2 or version 9 in this software. It has not been tested yet with the official release build of Windows 11, but it's, it will be tested. Corel Draw in version 8.2 will not be officially licensed under Windows 11. This is by Corel, it's not going to be licensed. Corel 2021, which is our new version with version 9, will be licensed under Windows 11. So um, by saying that it's not officially licensed, I'm not saying that it's you're going to have trouble with Corel in version 8.2. In the testing that Bernina International did, um, they didn't find any particular things that happened with Windows 11. I personally do not have a uh, Windows 11, so I can't for sure say. Um, I do quite a lot of work in Corel, so um, when it, if I get Windows 11, I'll be able to tell you more, but right now, I can't tell you for sure. I just know that Bernina International didn't have any problems with Windows 11 in the testing that they did. Okay, I am ready for questions. Oh, one more thing. Um, I do have a class, an online class called What's New in uh, Version 9? That is no, November 30th. Um, and I will have one at the beginning of next year as well. Somebody this morning, in this morning's class asked, what's the difference? This is a webinar. The class is a hands-on class where you will be working in the software and working with the new features of the software. So it will be after you've, you've downloaded the software and you've got it up and running and you'll work with me through the software and that there is a charge for that class. Now, Emily, I'm ready for questions. Okay, can you hear me, Debbie? I can. Okay, good. <laughs> Hi, everybody, welcome back. Uh, we have a few questions here. After I install or update version nine, do I have to uninstall version eight? Um, no, you should not have to. If you're, now, if you have it on, uh, when you're initially updating and you select merge, then the components uh, will be removed that okay. that you have saved. Okay. Uh, will the videos uh, be available? I believe they're talking about the tutorial vid videos uh, through YouTube, even if you don't have version nine. Uh, they will. You won't be able to access them um, at least I don't think so as a playlist, but I, I can't tell for sure because right now the videos are hidden on YouTube. They're not available yet and they will be hidden until the software is introduced. I don't know if they're going to be on a playlist. Um, if there is, I'll have to check that out and see. Um, okay. But they certainly, you could do a search for them, but YouTube can be kind of frustrating when you search for things because it doesn't give you a nice uh, in order list. Gotcha. Uh, we've had two requests for a webinar on how to map alphabets. So it sounds like a topic that people are interested in. So we can uh, definitely put that on the possibility possibility list. Yes, yeah. definitely. And 
then will there be software lessons avail available through our dealer next year? Um, there should be. Um, and by the way, that was another thing I wanted to address. Mastery books have been written for the new versions. There'll be one for Creator and one for Designer Plus. Um, they are almost done. Yay! <laughs> so uh, doing the final proofing now, and so uh, those will will be available. And then the dealers will be teaching from those if they choose to teach from those. Okay. And uh, will we be having your online software classes again next year? And do you know any of the topics? Um, yes, <laughs> I have quite a few new ones and um, I will be working in version nine next year. Although even if you choose not to update, you're still, you still can take the lessons with version eight. Um, you just won't be able to do some of the new things. Um, I've got a, an applicate class and actually I'm teaching that in December and uh, there's going to be a quilting with artwork canvas that will be a new class there'll be one on multi hooping they'll I've got to get my cheat sheet here <laughs> let's see um, I, I still am teaching design works next year there will be the what's new class again that is working through um, the step-by-step -step in version nine. There'll be a class on designing in Quilter, introduction to digitizing, advanced editing, which I just finished teaching, but next, next year it's gonna be on version nine. And then um, beyond the basics of digitizing, that's that's to, to name a few. If you have any requests, email me. <laughs> okay, uh, we have, can we use fonts that we have personally digitized for our keyboard collections? Yes. Fun. Okay, and then can you convert an ESA font collection to the KDC format? No. Yeah, the ESA is specifically for Hatch and Wilcom software, just okay. like BX fonts are specifically for Embrilliance. Okay. And we have time for just a few more questions. And let's see. How do you manage what is on the Wi-Fi device from within the software or from your sewing machine? How do you delete? Is that what so the how do you how do you manage what's on the Wi-Fi device? Oh, from that's within the kind of, software or the sewing machine. Um, you know, that's a good question. I uh, I would imagine it's in terms of deleting, it would be best to delete from the machine. Okay. Um, because the device is connected to the machine, um, so you, I don't think you could delete it from your computer. I think it's going to have to be done at the sewing machine. Okay. Now you send them, you manage in terms of sending them from your computer, but when you delete it, I, I'm pretty sure you would have to delete from the machine. Okay. And then our that, last question, I think that's, I think that's the answer. Our last question is, uh, with all of our files and designs be safe and untouched when we upgrade to version nine? Will they be saved? I, um, like, will they still be there when they upgrade to version nine? Will they just convert? Are over? you talking your personal designs that that you've created? I'm I'm thinking is what they're they're saying. I believe so. Yeah. So unless you delete the folder of your designs after you install the software, it's that the those design files are not going to be overwritten. Okay. It's that's all the. I would suggest that you still back up your designs that you've done. And that way, I mean, I always back up the designs because I, I work on another computer as well. And that way I don't have to recreate them on that second computer because they don't magically just transfer to that second computer. So I have a backup <laughs> file that I take out of the one computer and then put it in the other computer and then upload them on the other computer. 
Well, thank you everybody for coming to our webinar today. That's all the time we have. So we want to thank you for attending and I'm glad that everybody is excited about version nine. So are we, and we hope to see you on another future Bernina of America webinar. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Emily. And thank you everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.